It has been over a year since Jurassic World Evolution graced the market. The months of intense hype, pre-release speculation and yearning for a spiritual successor to Operation Genesis seem to have finally amalgamated into the game of our dreams, under the careful stewardship of a respected studio in Frontier Developments. The game launched on the 12th of June 2018 to worldwide success and amazing fanfare. It was the studio's most successful launch to date. The coinciding with Jurassic World's resurgence has certainly helped, but clearly there was still a massive desire in the gaming community for a dinosaur theme park simulator. And with the name Jurassic World slapped on top of it, there was even more reason to believe in the ambition of the project. It is perhaps why this game has been so intensely scrutinized at launch, with very divisive reactions across the board, from the fierce Jurassic Park fanbase to the more casual simulation gamers. But a lot has changed over the year or so, several huge updates coupled with 6 new paid DLCs have cemented the argument that Frontier has no doubt continued to support the game. So here we are. I've been putting off this review for a while now, but I wanted to make sure I gave Frontier the opportunity to continue their full support of the game until it was inevitably shifted into second gear for Frontier's new game, Planet Zoo, releasing next month. This way I could judge what I believe was the closest thing to a completed post-release game. And at this point in time, with the amount of content introduced, and in my opinion on how the game has progressed, I believe it has reached the pinnacle of its potential. So looking back, how does this game shape up as an addition into the AAA simulation market? Has the game improved from launch? Has it ultimately captured the lost generation that has yearned for a game like this for more than a decade? Is it worth playing now for the price it is currently advertised? This is Jurassic World Evolution, a year in review. When Jurassic World Evolution first released, one thing was clear, it was a damn beautiful game. The game's graphics engine provided a crisp visual presentation, lighting effects were sensational, the scenery breathtaking. Weather effects such as rain were also one of the best from any game I've ever graced my eyes upon. The plattering of raindrops on the backsides of large sauropods, translucent puddles forming on the ground, even the grass swaying with the wind were particularly soothing and sometimes therapeutic. As the game's day-night system cycled through, it showcased the dynamic lighting effects of the engine. The game looked spectacular whether it was dawn, day, dusk or night. The real achievement however was the game's performance. Even at launch, with a multitude of bugs, the game ran pretty damn well on many systems and it was clear it was well optimized, even without having a pre-launch beta. It's a real testament to how beautifully this game is presented without causing the player's frame rates to suffer accordingly. The sound design of Jurassic World Evolution is also another particular highlight. Large herbivores emanate bassy, booming calls that reverberate throughout the park, adding a weighty feel that matches the size of the respective dinosaurs. The higher pitched sounds made by the smaller dinosaurs added to their own allure. Many of the classic canon dinosaurs also had faithful recreations of their own sounds, such as the instantly recognizable raptor screeches, the poison firing squeal of the Dilophosaurus, or the iconic roars of the Tyrannosaurus Rex. This combination of dinosaur sounds took advantage of the entire audio spectrum. The variety meant no dinosaur sounded the same, and you could even identify a certain species by the sounds they would make, despite having a park full of loud monstrosities. The re-envisioning of the series' iconic music by Jeremiah Pena delivers a trip down nostalgia lane, but also provides a peaceful and pleasant soundtrack to accompany the tasty visuals of the game, particularly the use of wind and string instruments to bring about the classic crescendos and melodies of the original soundtrack, it felt as if John Williams himself had composed the game's music. However, turn off the in-game music and you can equally appreciate the intricacies of the ambience. Frogs croaking, crickets chirping and bird noises epitomize the game's tropical setting and provide an immersive atmosphere. Overall, the sound design is well crafted and articulated, deserving of applause. The user interface for the most part is tactile, easy to grasp and understand. 
The transparent bluish tech noir theme of the UI, I felt, was a pretty good representation of the evolution from Jurassic Park's more archaic, robust character to Jurassic World's modernized New Age engineering flavor. These factors all combine to offer a pleasingly and professionally presented addition to the Jurassic World media that is expected of a AAA game endorsed by Universal Studios. The dinosaurs of Jurassic World Evolution are brought into the limelight in spectacular fashion, arguably the best looking dinosaurs in any game ever. Besides some initial bugs and instances of clipping, the dinosaurs are well detailed, high fidelity, and came with a set of their own personalized skins that gave a new colorful splash every time. Their movement is well crafted, they didn't resemble a mechanically induced robot, but moved and breathed like, well, real moving and breathing animals. It also seemed that Frontier had compromised between scientific consensus and the representations in the canon. Dinosaurs such as Carnotaurus, T-Rex and Velociraptor were very much re-visualizations of their film counterparts, whilst lesser known dinosaurs from the Jurassic Park universe are faithfully adapted from the limited amount of references available, such as Suchomimus. Frontier's original non-canon dinosaur choices are introduced with decent, if not passable, scientific accuracy, but still retained a bit of the unique mythos and flair that made dinosaurs in this series so awe-inspiring. The dinosaurs are so convincing that at times I felt like I was enjoying a new Jurassic World movie and seeing these dinosaurs on the big screen for the first time. It's a fine line between keeping it authentic whilst respecting the Jurassic Park universe, but I thought Frontier rode the line quite smoothly. Frontier's choices for the base game roster were generally well received. A selection of iconic and pivotal dinosaurs from the movies, sprinkled with an array of unique, lesser known candidates that had some influence in the Jurassic World lore. The especially pleasing part was the studio's willingness to branch out from dinosaurs irrespective of references. Gigant Spinosaurus, Sintausaurus, and Chasmosaurus were some examples of non-canon dinosaurs that were reasonably popular with the public. Their addition has since helped to expose lesser known dinosaurs to the Jurassic fanbase. DLC and free LC additions were for the most part very satisfactory as well, filling out the dinosaur roster with important inclusions from the movies, as can be seen with the Fallen Kingdom patch, to dinosaurs that have been mentioned but had yet to make full-fledged appearances on screen. These included Dreadnoughtus and Euoplocephalus. Furthermore, Frontier has wholeheartedly embraced the crowd's nostalgic sentiments and adapted dinosaurs from other Jurassic Park games into their own game, these included Herrerasaurus and Troodon from Telltale's Jurassic Park The Game. Notably, with the introduction of the recent herbivore dinosaur pack, the entire original roster of Operation Genesis has also been adapted. The final roster of Jurassic World Evolution now is a culmination of iconic on-screen classics, lore reference candidates, or carefully chosen originals that have been expertly adapted to not only respect the Jurassic Park universe, but are also passable in their attempts of scientific accuracy. However, there were some abominations. The divisive Deinonychus was an attention raiser ever since it was revealed to sport a highly inaccurate head crest and didn't really appeal to either the science appreciators or fans of the series. And don't get me started with the hybrids. These guys are highly controversial. Some welcome the change from dinosaurs to genetically engineered monsters, akin with the direction that the Jurassic World film series was heading towards, but others argued it started getting out of hand when Frontier were introducing their own hybrids, such as Ankylodocus or Spinoraptor. Personally, I found them distasteful, but recognize that a large part of the fanbase do enjoy this direction, and thus I can't hold this as a critique against Frontier's choices. Take away the pretty facade, however, and players, myself included, notice a genuine lack of personality to the dinosaurs. Each individual had its own needs in hunger, drink, and the later implemented sleep. Furthermore, they needed a suitable environment in adequate space, water or foliage requirements. However, there is a lack of dynamism that makes the dinosaurs stand out like animals instead of simple theme park cash cow monsters. Socialization was and still is lackluster. Groups of single species dinosaurs would simply form a circle and exchange grunts at each other for a few seconds before breaking back into whatever they were nonchalantly doing before. 
This was remedied slightly with the addition of the herding and alpha mechanics that allows the same animals to move together in a concerted group, but this also looks very artificial and unnatural, especially when some individuals were performing the same animation. I was surprised herding was not implemented to encompass different animals as well. Why not have herds of different herbivores interacting together like those huge scenes we see in the movies? Would have definitely added a more enriching portrayal to interspecies dynamics. They're moving in herds. They do move in herds. Dinosaurs in this game live out their lives on a seemingly scheduled monotony. Once hungry, tired or thirsty, they are coded to quickly rush to the closest location in which they can satisfy that desire. In between these actions are the useless animations that include wandering about, the social circle talking or the uninspired herding. Herbivores will sometimes seemingly graze the local fauna but this has no effect on their hunger levels. After a while of observation, the realization arrives that they are just so robotic and lifeless. It's hard to appreciate or remember any individual dinosaurs because there is no differentiating factor that makes them stand out on their own. The dominance and territorial fighting system was added in a post-release patch to add some more flavor, but this is conditional, activated once a species group reaches but does not exceed their social limit. Additional animations or more natural and meaningful interactions between same species individuals, interspecies individuals and with their surrounding environment was sorely needed in this regard. Even the Velociraptor, portrayed as the most intelligent dinosaur in the canon, acts and feels like a copy-paste with all the other small carnivores. Where is their defining intuition? It was a theme in the movies that this creature finds a way out of everything and ends up being antagonist in some momentous scenes. So why is it so easy just to plug raptors into your park without a thought given to their potentially disruptive behavior? Oh yeah, and we still don't have pack hunting. I mean, all the carnivores suffer from this lackadaisical attitude. It should be an extremely risky venture to invest into housing these dangerous animals and should force the player to second guess or think long-term strategies before accommodating them. Some people will argue this is all unnecessary complexity, but for a game attempting to portray dinosaurs at this sort of magnitude, you'd expect their artificial intelligence to match that. Dinosaur behavior was highly anticipated prior to the release of the game. The movies have done such a great job at bringing dinosaurs to life and every successive addition to the franchise have fleshed out dinosaur dynamism greatly. So it is disappointing that to this day, despite many improvements, dinosaur behavior still feels flat and programmed rather than natural and organic. A far cry from the advertised dinosaurs that think, feel and react intelligently to the world around them. Their lack of character, their lack of soul ultimately cannot make up for their brilliant and stunning visual execution. Jurassic World Evolution initially offered two gameplay modes, campaign and an eventual sandbox rewarded after progressing through enough of the former. The game's story mode campaign takes you on a visually breathtaking journey through the fictional island archipelago of the Los Cincos Muertes, the Five Deaths, the setting of Crichton's Jurassic Park novellia and eventually the movie franchise. Players start off on Isla Matanceros, a semi-pre-built island intended to be the game's opening tutorial. Progressing through the relatively easy objectives will grant you access to the next island. Do the same there and eventually you progress to the sandbox mode, allowing you to build the park of your dreams on the large Isla Nublar. Each island along the way had its own unique starting situation. For instance, Isla Muerta was recently ravaged by a storm and needed initial repairs. Takano suffering from bankruptcy, while Sauna had wild dinosaurs to capture. Each island would then proceed with their own short but inconsequential storyline. Achieve 5 stars on that island, as well as progressing through enough contracts with the three divisions, and you would unlock rewards that you can utilize immediately across all game modes. That was pretty much it. After getting through the first hurdles presented to you on each island, eventually it just boils down to finishing off contracts and achieving 5 stars before repeating the same process again on another island. Sure, each island's irregular shape, 
terrain features and weather conditions provided some differences to spice up the repetitive process, but the campaign became a drag pretty quickly. Personally, it became a necessity for me to complete the campaign just to unlock everything, rather than an enjoyable experience I would want to go through again. Furthermore, besides some cherry-picked references, it was disappointing the campaign did not take advantage of the rich Jurassic Park canon. Expanding more on the origin stories of the dinosaurs and the islands in relation to the greater cinematic universe would have made the easily forgettable storyline slightly more memorable. The later Secrets of Dr. Wu and Claire Sanctuary did heavily reference the first Jurassic World and Fallen Kingdom respectively, but again it seems evolution was just an unnecessary side drama that Frontier or Universal did not want to heavily intertwine into the greater overarching canon. For a game attempting to become a management sim, it needs strong interactions between its two key facets, the product and the consumer. In this case, Jurassic World Evolution's product is the dinosaur attractions, and the consumers, the visitors. However, its attempt at the dinosaur theme park simulator is resultingly mediocre and bare bones. Visitor interaction is especially dire. Although they should be a pivotal component in this genre, they are little more than soulless sprites that are there for visual representation of how busy your park is. And that's about it. Satisfying visitors is fairly one-dimensional, provide food, drinks, shopping, fun and transport needs through various amenity buildings, whilst providing dinosaur viewing range by building attractions such as viewing galleries or towers. In return, they fuel most of your in-game economy by providing ticket income and attraction income on a per minute basis. This can be improved by increasing dinosaur population and or improving dinosaur variety. Besides the effects of disasters such as tornadoes or breakouts, there is no fluctuation to this whatsoever, a flat rate income that is influenced by how satisfied your visitors are. Mechanics such as the ability to select the products and prices offered to the guest create the illusion of depth to the player, but these features are meaningless. It's just a simplistic subpar economic model. Furthermore, the player cannot select or interact with the visitors in any way. There is no sense of visitor traffic flow or crowding in a standard theme park sim as guests do not organically embark from a typical entrance point, they just spawn and appear at arbitrary locations along your park network and disappear from it in basically the same way. Visitor interactions with the dinosaurs is also non-existent. Scripted animations of guests pointing out towards dinosaurs enhance this illusion but in reality there is no connection between them. Visitors have no individual preferences on which dinosaurs they would like to see, they have no thoughts on how secure they feel, whether prices are too high, or the beauty factor of the surrounding environment. Like the dinosaurs, they themselves have no personality. In some other management aspects, the game does a good, if unremarkable job. There is a research system to progressively unlock new things, dig site mechanic to excavate dinosaur remains and extract their DNA, before utilizing a pretty in-depth genetic system to shape the stats and appearance of your dinosaur before incubation. These stats improve the dinosaur's rating and have some effects on gameplay, such as lifespan and disease resistance. However, these genetic stats really seem to be geared towards another crude system, the shaping of dinosaurs in order to pit them to battle against each other. So yeah, death duels. It's essentially a 1v1 attrition fight whereby whichever dinosaur with the higher stats wins. Death duels are heavily scripted. They form a circle and take turns swiping at each other until a final death animation is triggered. It's another fun for a little bit type of gameplay feature but gets repetitive pretty quickly. It's just puzzling how this was executed because the chance was here to do something pretty special. In order to create challenge, the game throws at you artificial events intended to cause chaos. Whether events such as storms slowly eat away at dinosaur comfort levels before they reach an arbitrary threshold in which they begin to smash their enclosure fencing. Tornadoes are even more disastrous as not only do they make dinosaurs uncomfortable, but they also cause a path of destruction, disrupting power lines, damaging buildings and destroying fences. 
If you play in a mode that involves the free divisions, neglecting their contracts can also cause sabotage events ranging from power shutdowns to a sudden opening of all park gates. All of these eventuate to one major consequence, escaped dinosaurs. Escaped dinosaurs and more alarmingly escaped carnivores are the single most annoying thing intended to disrupt the player. Solve easily enough however, simply trank them, repair their fence and send them back into the enclosure. Deaths caused by rampaging dinos incur temporary penalties in your finances but subside in due time with little effect on the player. Another event is the disease system that can spawn random illnesses on any dinosaur in your park, slowly spreading to other dinosaurs and eventually killing them unless you research the specific cure and immunize the dinosaurs in time. Yeah, there's no way to perform preventative measures, there's no conditions for diseases to manifest, just another artificially induced challenge to keep the player on their toes. In essence, this game is a chaos simulator. Even if you're a perfect player, bad things cannot be prevented. They will happen to you. You will have escaped dinosaurs. You will have to react. But in the end, there is just no long-term consequence to truly punish the player to make them adapt or change their methods for the next event. It's just a repetitive cycle that gets old real quick. Yeah, you could say it follows the same disaster formula of the first movie, but as a game you'd expect a lot more inherent problems and issues trying to keep giant 66 million year old animals at bay. The greatest criticism of Jurassic World Evolution has to be its customizability. Coming hot off Planet Coaster, which was universally praised for its modular building system and the level of creativity it offered to players, many were expecting this game to provide a similar experience, but with dinosaurs. In-game, the majority of available customization involves the terrain. This was initially limited to simple elevation, smoothing and flattening tools, a foliage and water brush. Post-release updates have expanded this to allow painting of sand, dirt and rocky terrain and individual placements of specific trees and rock formations. By far my favourite addition was the new foliage brushes which allowed application of grasses, shrubs and bushery to add vibrancy to the terrain floor. The tools are functional and adequate, improving on the base game for sure, but they don't offer the creative freedom to build exotic or detailed habitats such as those seen in the movies. Sadly, almost nothing else is customizable. The buildings, although individually well detailed, cannot be customized beyond the point of choosing where they are constructed. It's a real statement that screenshots from different individual players of the Evolution game end up looking pretty similar. The island maps themselves are severely restrictive. With the current roster of dinosaurs, it's almost impossible to accommodate every single one of them without feeling cramped or confined. The map introductions from DLCs such as Muerta East or Sanctuary have not addressed the issue, and it is felt across the community a super mega sized map is sorely needed. Size issue aside, the inability to utilize the entire island is also another disappointing factor. It would have been amazing to be able to feature dinosaurs from the beaches all the way to the mountaintops, but understandably this would have major consequences for the running performance of the game. It's all what ifs at this point, but personally I felt that the direction Frontier chose to push this game in was never geared towards creativity in the first place, and ultimately this has come to alienate a significant portion of their fanbase that have enjoyed the freeform freedom available in titles such as Planet Coaster. Post-release support has indeed been a highlight of Frontier's stalwart policy of listening to player feedback and implementing necessary changes. Every update, DLC or FreeLC introduced has been positive and added much needed quality of life improvements, additional dinosaurs and more gameplay elements to breathe much needed life into the game. Has it been enough but? With Frontier's introduction of a challenge mode and the expansion of sandbox mode to encompass all the in-game islands, the replayability of the game has somewhat increased. Players can now return and feel slightly less repetition from their last playthrough with a new setting, but the core gameplay is still the same. There's really not many different ways to play this game. I find myself returning to the game for one thing only and that is the addition of new dinosaurs. 
Despite the gameplay, the dinosaurs have consistently been delivered with such a high standard that new species announcements are usually met with raucous anticipation. On the other hand, marine and flying reptiles were hugely anticipated to be in the game, and it's disappointing they still aren't. Despite the recent prevalence of Mosasaurus or Pteranodon or Dimorphodon in the recent films, and how willingly Frontier introduces Dinosaur from the Jurassic World media, as can be seen with the recent introduction of Nasutoceratops after its appearance in the short film Battle of Big Rock, it's almost inexcusable Frontier couldn't find a way to accommodate marine or flying reptiles into the game. I say almost because it's clear the game engine's inherent restrictiveness has made it extremely difficult to do so. Despite this, Frontier deserves a commendation for the effort they have put into the game since launch. It's a much more digestible version than what was served to us more than a year ago, and will endear to the fans who expect similar post-release support for their future games. I was honestly very disappointed with the game at launch. Even IGN's infamous and maybe slightly harsh 4.8 bad rating didn't seem too far off my initial reactions. But the game's continued representation of the best looking and sounding dinosaurs in any game medium ever in a beautifully crafted setting deserves praise. The dinosaur behavior, however, is a disappointing low point that has subsequently been improved to a decent but unremarkable state. I was eager to see how evolution would expand onto the already rich Jurassic Park universe, but was let down by the hollow storyline that fell back to cheap references and cringe-inducing jokes. The shallow, lack of depth gameplay has been scarcely improved and is a far shout from a memorable management sim, but it's adequate enough, I suppose, as an okayish dinosaur title on its own right. This game will be a hard pass for any players wishing to scratch that creative itch, and incremental additions post-launch have not solved the lack of customization. Frontier's post-release support is commendable and appreciated. They propelled the game to a solid state after an underwhelming launch, but some inherent issues just cannot be fixed. Overall, I give this game a final score of 6 out of 10. This game initially launched at a release price of $54.99 US dollars, pretty indicative of a lower end AAA game, and as such my first instinct is that the game was overpriced for what it offered at the time. A price change in March to $44.99 is much more suitable, but I feel it's really only worthwhile if you are truly after slick looking dinosaurs instead of an engaging simulation experience. The recent Frontier 25th anniversary sale brought the price to as low as $13.49, and at these prices it's great value for money. So my recommendation is grab it on sale or choke up the retail price if you are a truly desperate dinosaur fanatic. This DLC adds 5 dinosaurs to the already stacked roster. Suchomimus is undoubtedly the highlight, whilst Majungasaurus and Styracosaurus are welcome additions. The pack offers a range of dinosaurs with dubious references to the lore, but is great for variety. Most players would have shelled out the extra $10.99 US dollars during pre-order anyway, but as a separate DLC, it is kind of overpriced. Troodon and Allura Titan are joined by 3 controversial hybrids for a total of 5 dino hybrid saws. Again, some arguably great variety, but the storyline was again lackluster, campaign was again repetitive. The new genetic mechanics maybe should have been released for free. For a total of $14.99, I can't help but feel ripped off here, especially since I don't enjoy hybrids. Three huge dinosaur names in Kakarodontosaurus, Dreadnoughtus, and Iguanodon for just $4.99 sign me right up. Three dinosaurs with lore references for the same price. Even better that they were some of the more anticipated carnivores as well. Great value. A convoluted separate campaign with more tedious repetition, an underwhelming paleobotany mechanic sprinkled with a new attraction and some more dinosaurs. You do get two new large maps though, but the $14.99 price is another kick in the teeth. This DLC introduced a much more underwhelming roster of dinosaurs compared to the previous dinosaur packs, but for Variety Seekers or Operation Genesis fanatics, it's a decent buy at $4.99. 
I enjoyed the time I put into the game, but it was clear the more I trotted on through the repetitiveness, the less new things there were to discover. It was as if the game could be summed up in the first 10 hours of playtime and the rest was not vastly different from that initial experience. The restrictive gameplay and non-existent customization options means all players of Jurassic World Evolution have essentially played through the same experience with little personal variation. To me, this game is kinda like a glorified dinosaur screenshot simulator. The beautiful aesthetics allow for some breathtaking scenes, but it falls short when it tries to become more. If you're looking for a deep, proficient dinosaur park management sim, you will be disappointed. But if you're just after a casual, somewhat relaxing joyride with some tasty visuals and authentic dinosaurs for your postcard collection, I guess this game is right up your alley. This game won't leave a sizable marker like Jurassic Park Operation Genesis did all those years ago. There are many reasons why Jurassic World Evolution hasn't been able to become the classical triumph of its spiritual predecessor. Perhaps it was stifled by the decision to release the game on consoles. Perhaps the vision that the developers wanted the game to become was different from what the crowd yearned for. Maybe we've grown up too much and have too high expectations now. Maybe our nostalgia has gotten the best of us. Are dinosaurs just outdated? But even so, taking off those rose-tinted glasses, it's clear Jurassic World Evolution is a mediocre management sim at best, but with the bloody best-looking dinosaurs you can ever dream of. This is Jurassic World Evolution, a year in review.